Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So, Dr. Potney, thank you so very much for joining us for today's Care Connect combo. We've been hosting these weekly conversations with our Kelsey Siebold physicians, um, so we can stay connected to everyone during um, the COVID-19 pandemic in ways that we may not have been able to stay connected before because we're not in person anymore. Um, so thanks for joining us. I know you've taken some time out of your schedule and you have patients to see too. So we're going to keep this very short and quick. Um, we'll have a hard stop at two o'clock. So we'll have a quick 30 minute conversation with you. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do um, at Kelsey Siebold as a pulmonologist and part of our sleep medicine department? Sure, yeah. So I'm in the pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine department. So we do a, a handful of things. One is uh, we, we see patients in the hospital, in the ICUs, and on the, on the floors for pulmonary consults. Uh, a little bit more pertinent to, he, pertinent to hear is we also see patients in the clinic, uh, whether it's pulmonary problems, the bread and butter kind of things would be asthma, COPD, lung nodules, lung masses, lung cancer. Um, and then sleep problems, uh, you know, things like sleep apnea, narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome uh, are some of the more common kinds of sleep issues we see. Um, so how does sleep affect our immune system? We're hearing a lot about um, how COVID-19 affects our immune system and um, especially in the news, you hear a lot about building up your immune system with supplements. Can you tell us what um, sleep or lack thereof does to our immune system? Yeah, you know, it's probably not that well understood on a molecular or cellular basis exactly, you know, where which immune cells and, you know, what kind of cytokine signaling and all that stuff is affected. But definitely sleep does affect the immune system. I think many of us have experienced this. You know, we're more, you feel more likely to catch a cold uh, if you've been sleep deprived. Uh, and there are studies that actually show that uh, increased risk of catching a common cold uh, when you're sleep deprived. Another interesting thing that's been demonstrated is in people who are sleep deprived, uh, less of a response to the influenza vaccine. Uh, so less uh, antibody production uh, and less, uh, less vital, uh, less, uh, uh, less response. Uh, so that, that's kind of a, a good little indicator of, uh, you know, the effect on your immune system. So it's, uh, you know, among all the other health issues that, you know, sleep deprivation causes, immune system uh, uh, is a big one, especially right now, everybody's kind of uh, concerned about staying healthy. Yeah. Um, so what is considered a healthy amount of sleep for, let's say, our average adult 35 to 55? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's something that actually does need to be individualized. You know, the National Sleep Foundation will say seven to nine hours uh, for most adults, uh, though they also do comment that for some people, maybe six to seven might be appropriate. And for some people, maybe 10, no, sorry, maybe nine or 10 um, or even 11 sometimes may be appropriate. But the majority of people, it's kind of a bell curve, you know, and it's a fairly narrow bell curve. So most of the people are going to fall in that seven to nine range. But it's definitely true that there are some people who truly are short sleepers. I think it's probably a lot less uh, than the number of people who think they're short sleepers. But there are some people who are truly naturally short sleepers and, and don't need seven to nine hours and may be fine with something like six. Is that range the same for kids and teenagers as it is for adults? No, it's not. You know, it starts off with, you know, a newborn who, you know, newborns where it's recommended they get probably something like 17 to 19 hours, more than half of their day is spent sleeping, uh, newborn babies. And that, gra that number gradually comes down to where you know, when you're looking at school age children, we're talking about probably uh, uh, in the order of uh, nine to 11 hours of sleep. And once again, that's the majority and the National Sleep Foundation will say, well, there's, there's those margins where some will need maybe a little bit more and a little bit less, but nine to 11. Teenagers, now we're talking about eight to 10 hours of sleep and then into adulthood, then you come into that recommendation of seven to nine hours. Um, and does stress affect our sleep at all? Stress, yeah, well, you know, stress definitely 
uh, I think everybody, you know, has experienced, I think most people have experienced this, that stress definitely seems to affect our sleep. Uh, you know, it, the biggest way in which is in difficulty falling asleep, you know, insomnia. Um, uh, you know, if you go to bed with uh, uh, a really stressful situation or something weighing on you, uh, it is often very difficult to fall asleep. And oftentimes we find ourselves waking up in the middle of the night and then, you know, you're getting fixated on, on the stressful issue also and then having trouble falling back asleep. So there's no doubt about it that stress uh, does affect uh, sleep. Um, do you have any tips to help get a better night's sleep if you are feeling stressed? Are there certain things you should avoid? You hear things in the on social media like, you know, no screen time for an hour before bed. What are your recommendations to help your patients at Kelsey get a better night's rest? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it, it can be uh, uh, if and if you're suffering from stress and it's causing difficulty sleeping, you might want to take a broad approach to it. So you may want to start with just looking at your environment. Uh, yeah. Hi, guys. I think we lost Dr. Potney for a second there. I'm sure he will hop right back on. It looks like we were having a little bit of um, low bandwidth issues at our at his office today at one of our our clinics. Um, so I do apologize about that. If you guys can just hold on one second, as soon as he joins back, we will put him back on as a panelist. Oh, here he is. He's back with us again. So. Here we go. I think we're having a little bit of connectivity issues, Dr. Potney. Um, one second, we'll get you back set up as a panelist, so you'll be good to go here. Okay, there we go. All right, great. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, anyway, so what I was going to say is that you know you, you want to start with just looking at your bedroom environment. You know, is it is it a place that's inviting for sleep? You know, or uh, are you able to minimize noises um, from pets or children uh, or other people in the house or whether it's something outside the house? Uh, you'd like, you want to keep a cool environment to fall asleep. You know, the, the process of falling asleep involves a lot of, a lot of it involves your body giving off heat. Uh, and if you look at a curve of your body temperature, uh, body temperature is dropping as you're falling asleep and, and all the way through about the first two thirds of the night till it reaches its nadir and then it'll start to rise back up uh, and start the process of, of reawakening. So, uh, so uh, many people will recommend a temperature range of around 68 to 72. For some people that seems a little cool, but definitely on the cooler side does help falling asleep, giving off that heat. Uh, of course, everybody by now has heard that, you know, screens uh, uh, can be harmful in falling asleep, and, and that's definitely the case. Uh, most of the phones now have a setting where you can uh, turn off the blue light range, uh, the, the, of your, uh, uh, the blue end of the, the, the light frequency on your phone. So it's less stimulating, but I think it's probably even better to just avoid devices uh, for the last 30 minutes before getting into bed. And particularly once you're in bed, you know, bringing the laptop into bed with doing your work or uh, social media sometimes can be more stressful um, than we realize. So uh, getting those things out of the equation are helpful. Would you recommend, um, we have a question that came in from one of our attendees that said um, regarding supplements to help with sleep. Are there any supplements you would recommend such as melatonin or anything else over the counter to help with sleep? So melatonin can sometimes help on a short term basis. The data for melatonin really is for use in jet lag. Uh, that's where uh, it seems like it's the most helpful. The data for people in, with insomnia is, is really not the greatest. Um, uh, so, uh, but, you know, it's something that seems fairly harmless to try. You know, I haven't heard of any uh, bad cases of, you know, adverse effects or anything happening from trying melatonin. So generally, it's, it seems like an okay thing to try. And if it helps you, I think that's fine. Uh, one of the issues with supplements, of course, is you don't really know 
sometimes exactly how much you're getting. And when from one manufacturer to another, you may be getting different amounts of the medication. Sometimes really shockingly wide ranges of, of medication. So if you are going to go with a supplement, I would definitely try to find a kind of a well-established brand uh, to buy from. Um, uh, so, you know, melatonin is something you could definitely try. The data, once again, not that clear. After that, there's really kind of a drop off and there's not really a lot of data on a lot of these, these supplements. You know, there's been some studies where they've tried to find a little bit of a benefit from certain things, chamomile or whatnot, but the basic thing is that there hasn't been anything that's been well proven uh, to make a big difference uh, supplement wise in definite randomized controlled trials. Um, so we have another question that came in and it's related to gender and age with sleep deprivation and insomnia. Um, are you more likely to have sleep deprivation or insomnia as you're older? And is there a difference between men and women with um, the rate of sleep insomnia and sleep deprivation? Well, the, 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 it's important to distinguish sleep deprivation is actually volitional. You know, that's something we do to ourselves. And, and when we're, you know, burning the candle at both ends or just trying to get too much or have too much to, do, to be done or, or sometimes it's, you know, unfortunately, you know, to make end meet, ends meet, people have two jobs or three jobs and then they have kids at home. So it's just only so many hours in a day. So sleep deprivation is something we do to ourselves. Insomnia is difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep and it causing some um, adverse functioning either during the daytime, meaning difficulty concentrating at work or, or something like that. So that's what insomnia is. Uh, there is a little bit of a decline in the amount of hour, uh, time slept when people age and, you know, over the age of 65, uh, the people do sleep a little bit less. And even if you look at recommendations for sleep from the National Sleep Foundation, for people over the age of 65, their recommendation will drop from seven to nine for adults to like seven to eight for people over the age of 65. So that kind of also kind of suggests that a little bit of a natural drop in sleep duration for adult, uh, older adults, but not that much. You know, generally older adults should be sleeping al also. Um, so um, is there um, uh, an increase? Not necessarily, um, but elder adults may sleep a slight bit less, and then more older adults will experience a phase, a sleep phase uh, advancement, so that some some people have an earlier sleep cycle uh, as they get older than they had when they were, uh, you know, when they were uh, in their middle life. So they may be going to bed a little bit earlier and waking up a little bit earlier. As long as your lifestyle allows you to accommodate for that, then that generally works out okay. But it doesn't apply to everybody. And as far as gender differences, not aware of any big differences there between men and women across the board at, at older age. Um, at younger ages, it sometimes uh, insomnia does seem to affect women more often than men um, in the younger ages. Um, so while we're on the topic of insomnia, we had a question that came in about diagnosing it. Can you explain what you do in your, in your practice at Kelsey to diagnose um, insomnia and other sleep issues? Do you always have to do a sleep study is specifically the question that came in. That's a great question. And the answer is no, we don't always uh, have to do a sleep study. And in fact, for certain problems, a sleep study is not in indicated because it's not going to really give you an answer, the answer that you're looking for. Insomnia, for example, that since you mentioned, is really just diagnosed clinically. And it's basically what we, we already talked about, which is you know difficulty falling asleep or maintaining sleep. And that difficulty falling asleep or maintaining sleep is resulting in some kind of dysfunction in your life, you know, whether it's you know relationship problems or difficulty functioning at work or whatnot and it's pretty much that simple and it's usually something that's chronic that's been going on for a, you know a few months you know um, everybody has experienced some short-term insomnia week or two some stressful experience in life or life event uh difficulty sleeping but uh, insomnia usually when we talk about insomnia we're talking about chronic insomnia so something lasting longer than that period um, At which, what point should someone seek medical attention if they are having insomnia? And another question that came in related to insomnia was, 
is there anything you should do at home before you seek medical attention? That's a great question too. So, um, you know, you should seek med medical attention if, you know, if you're kind of meeting the criteria, meaning not only that are you having this trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, but it's affecting your life in some way or another. So I think that that would be enough to prompt seeking medical attention. What I would do uh, before uh, seeking attention, though, would be to uh, make sure that my sleep hygiene is kind of in order. A lot of people kind of have heard these things, you know, uh, here and there, um, but sometimes uh, you really got to sit down and make sure you take an inventory of what you're doing and what kind of things can you change. So uh, it, that means things as simple as, you know, making sure you have a regular sleep schedule. You know, you're trying to go to bed around the same time and wake up at the same time. Uh, in the mornings, including weekends, as much as you can, uh, that you're eliminating or reducing at least caffeine. Um, you know, caffeine can uh, stay in the system for quite a while. The half life's around five or six hours. You know, so if at noon you're having a big cup of coffee, say 100 milligrams of coffee, well, you know, by you know 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. or midnight, you know, you still are going to have around 25 milligrams of caffeine in your system. So, um, you know. I typically tell people, you know, keep the caffeine to really just the morning coffee or tea or soda, maybe in the morning. But after that, um, I would I would try to avoid it. Um, regular exercise, you know, um, helps your body get physically tired. Not, you know, not right before bedtime. And we typically say at least three or four hours before bedtime because that just if you do it right before bedtime. That's just going to rev you up and make it harder to fall asleep. But regular physical exercise. Um, of, of course, we talked about the things in your bedroom environment and screens um, and stuff like that. So you want to kind of, you know, attend to all of those kind of things uh, and make sure it's not a simple matter of, you know, of, of sleep hygiene uh, before you try to go deeper into your insomnia problem. Um, so we do have some other questions that are coming in and I know we're getting near to the end of our talk. So we want to make sure we get those answered. Um, one question came in was about nightmares. If someone's experiencing extremely vivid dreams or nightmares, is there anything that you can do to make them stop? Um, and then on the flip side of that, is that more common with children than adults or do we sort of, do you sort of see that across the board? Yeah, it, it is more common with children. Everybody's seen, you know, seen this with kids, you know, they'll start uh, at some point, you know, when they're, starting to get some awareness and, and stuff and, uh, in, in, their, uh, in their school age years they start having a nightmare every now and then. So it's nothing to be alarmed about. Even adults get nightmares too. Uh, there's no age limit on nightmares. So anybody can get them. But when it becomes a problem is when it's related to some underlying issue. A nightmare itself is not necessarily, is not a pathologic thing or there's nothing uh, that's wrong with it, but it's a problem when it's related to some underlying issue. For example, post-traumatic stress disorder can be a cause of recurring nightmares um, or just something like depression, you know, anxiety, you know, so, so you really kind of want to tackle the underlying problem. You can also try to deal with the nightmare itself. Um, there are techniques that you could see a therapist for, for example, um, image uh, rehearsal therapy where, you, you know, you may, uh, you may kind of, with a therapist, go through the nightmare scenario. What happens, if it's, especially if it's a recurring nightmare? Well, what's happening? And then you kind of change the ending of that nightmare to something that's a lot more acceptable and pleasant, or at least not threatening. And then you rehearse that in your mind so that when next time you go through that nightmare during your sleep, hopefully it takes the, the path that's not as, uh, as scary. You know, there, are, there is a you know, medication that is sometimes tried uh, uh, the main medicine is called prazosin. It's an alpha antagonist, so that sometimes can be helpful. Uh, the data is is hard to you know to determine, but that's probably the most established one that people have tried. But oftentimes it can be managed sometimes with things like uh, you know uh, trying to redirect the story, the narrative of the nightmare. Um, and in terms of sleep being a common problem that people have in the U.S. What, do you have any data that you can share with us on how many people are affected by sleep issues in the US? And are there any serious complications for having long-term sleep issues if they go untreated? 
oh well yeah, I think if you added up everything like insomnia and sleep apnea and sleep deprivation you'd probably say that you know well over 50 percent of the population has something um you know if you just look at something like sleep apnea it depends on how you define it you know there are studies that have said that you know, up to 25% of people have sleep apnea. Now that's if you you're, have a pretty inclusive thing and you include the mildest cases uh, that are probably not causing an issue. Uh, if you can include cases where, you know, okay, there's some, you know, symptoms involved or the significant, we're still looking at significant numbers of, you know, who knows, three to 6% or something like that in studies. Insomnia, even higher. Everybody's experienced it at one point or another, but chronic insomnia, you know, is going to be affecting substantial numbers of people. So, uh, you know, and then you take sleep deprivation, um, you know, a, you know, a survey say one third of people admit to sleeping less than seven hours of sleep at night. And generally, I wouldn't think that one third of the population needs that little of sleep. So it's a very common problem. Um, so we had a question that came in sort of about a trend in sleep, weighted sleep blankets. Are those effective in helping you get a better night's sleep or is it just a fad? Well, you know, I haven't seen research that's really been conclusive about it, but, it, and it's hard to conduct that kind of research. You, you know, you're not going to be able to do a great study where you blind people to it, but, um, you know, there are some people who suggested in less, less rigorous studies that, yeah, there's been some improvement in, in uh, you know, minutes to fall asleep uh, in some people trying it. You may be selecting out people who are more motivated and stuff, but these are easy enough things to try without a lot of, you know, without any really risk. I wouldn't do it in young kids, uh, but, but other than that, I wouldn't uh, uh, be afraid to try it if, if you want. And there, I, anecdotally, I've talked to a lot of people who f find it to be helpful. Uh, for whatever reason, it feels like it's kind of a cocooning thing or, or whatnot, or helps them calm them down as they're falling asleep. Uh, but uh, there are many people using them with success. So uh, it's something worth trying if you think it might help. And then we do have two more questions that came in. So we'll go ahead and ask you those and then we'll start wrapping up because I know you have to get back to seeing patients as well. Um, another question was also sort of about sleep trends regarding essential oils being diffused. Um, are there any studies about diffusing lavender or any other oils to help with sleep? No, there aren't. But you know, once again, these are things that that you know it's 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 easy to try. And if if you want to try it, I never discourage people from trying things that have no downside. So you definitely could could give those a shot. Yeah. Um, we have another question that came in about um, Kelsey Siebold and their sleep department. So um, are you accepting new patients at this time? And do you, is there any sort of procedure or process in place um, before they would request an appointment with the sleep center? Do they need to see a primary care physician at Kelsey first or um, anything like that? Well, it may depend partly on your plan. We are definitely accepting new patients. Uh, there are 10 of us in the pulmonary uh, department, and we go to probably half of the clinics, the Kelsey Siebel clinics throughout the city. And of course, uh, we do uh, video visits, virtual visits, and been doing a lot more of those lately. Uh, whether or not you need a referral or you can just make an appointment will probably depend on your own situation with your health plan. We see people who, uh, when I ask them, who sent you here? A lot of times the answer is my wife you know, or my husband. Um, and then sometimes it's, well, my primary care doctor. So it might depend on your plan. So do you have any other parting words or pieces of advice you'd like to give to our attendees about getting a better night's sleep? Well, I think that um, it's, I think I'd just say it's something to pay attention to and not give short trips. Uh, for a long time, it was kind of a badge of honor to uh, uh, the less you sleep was kind of a, a kind of the more a, a boasting thing and it was a badge of honor to be only sleeping five or six hours a night but I think that there's a growing awareness in our country that sleep deprivation really affects our quality functioning and even safety so um, so it's something to definitely give attention to great well thanks for joining us today dr. Potney um, if you have any other questions for dr. Potney and you'd like us to try to get answers for those for you, you can go ahead and submit them in the comments on our Facebook page. Uh, we are streaming there as well. 
And um, we hope that you'll join us again next week. We'll be logging on on Thursday, May 21st with Dr. Harrison. He's an allergist with Kelsey Siebel. So we'll be talking a lot about summer allergies and um, you know, sort of treatments for allergies and diagnosing allergies at this time. Um, thanks again for joining us for our Care Connect combo. And um, thank you again, Dr. Potney. And we hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Paige.